Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Susan Bacham, and I'd like to welcome everyone today to the first collaborated joint endorsement interviews for the endorsements of Veterans in Politics International, the Nevada Democratic Veterans and Military Families Caucus, Nevada Veterans Association, and the Armed Forces Chamber PAC. I'd like to also thank our sponsors, Monzu Italian Oven and Bar, Stephanie Phillips, candidate for the United States Senate, and an anonymous donation on behalf of Jerry Willick. We're going to start out today by having our panel members introduce themselves, and then after they do that, our candidates will each have about a minute-ish, um, because we had some other um, activities we had to take care of first, about a minute to introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about you. Uh, we will then have, go back to the panelists who will then start asking questions. We'll trade off back and forth. Jim Jonas is going to tell you when he's going to give you the ax if you're talking too long. And um, we'll just keep it moving simply. So again, thanks everybody for being here. Jim? Jim Jonas, Director of Veterans and Politics. When you get the yellow, that means you got 15 seconds. When you get red, that means I'm going to ask you to stop. Thank you for being here. I'm Andre Haynes, founder and CEO of the Armed Forces Chamber. Uh, Patsy Brown, president of Armed Forces Chamber. <laughs> Kelly Charles, executive board member of the Democratic Military and Veterans Family Caucus. Rob Lauer, Veterans and Politics. Frank Friends, Veterans and Politics. Tara Kellen with uh, the Democratic Party. Hi, Barbara Lucian, representing Veterans in Politics. Judge Cruz, if you'd like to start and tell us a little bit about yourself. So good afternoon. My name is Cynthia Cruz. I am uh, been a resident of Las Vegas, Nevada for 54 years. Parents moved here when I was about a year and a half old. Product of the public school system. Went through school here, went to my undergraduate education at UNLV, and returned later on um, to go to law school here at UNLV. I have uh, over 20 years as a licensed attorney in the state of Nevada. I've been on the bench for over 11 years since being on the bench and being an elected official. Um, I've worked hard to work on serving our community to improve justice in the system and connect it with community. A few things that I've been uh, involved with, Project 48, which helped diminish a lot of things. I've served on multiple committees throughout the state of Nevada and through our court to improve things. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Madeline Cole. I have been born and raised in Las Vegas. I am a fourth generation Nevadan and I'm proud to be a Nevadan. I'm currently raising my family here. And from a young age, I always knew that I wanted to be a lawyer. Um, in my family, I was I was I had a front row seat to public service, um, and obviously the reward and satisfaction that comes from that. And I knew from a very young age that I wanted to be a lawyer and that I wanted to be involved in public service. Um, after law school, I started my career in the Clark County District Attorney's Office, and have been with them my entire career. I started out as a law clerk. Um, drafting responses to um, appellate briefs and post-conviction petition writs for habeas corpus. I've been a chief deputy district attorney. I've tried cases. I've appeared in justice court, district court for the duration of my career. Thank you both. Um, Jim, would you like to ask the first question? Okay, this question is for both of you, and thank you guys for coming this afternoon. Uh, we all know that the courtroom, maybe not for you guys, but the courtroom can be a very scary place. So sitting on the bench, what would you guys do to kind of put uh, the uh, litigants in front of you at ease, make them feel a little more comfortable? Cynthia, you can go ahead and start. So this, this comes in front of... Um, Las Vegas Justice Court bunch. Um, while we have a, a very robust criminal um, avenue, we do have civil, and most of our litigants that come in front of the court for civil matters are not represented. So it's very important as a judge to make sure that everybody coming in understands that it is a fair and impartial forum. You also have to understand a lot of times people have barriers and working through that dynamic and that you sometimes have to 
adjust how you are interacting with people so that you can help your litigants in front of you overcome certain barriers. Maybe it's that they have a language barrier and you're working on trying to get them uh, language aid. Maybe it's something that instead of trying to talk in, in high letter $20, $100 words, you kind of bring it down into having it that they can understand. So that's always important. I would definitely say justice court is a court of the people. Um, a lot of people, you know, obviously, even in a criminal capacity, have an opportunity and ability to represent themselves. Um, but it's a it's a court that oftentimes people can be coming in without attorneys. And so I think the biggest thing um, to make people feel at ease is transparency and respect, um, treating everybody fairly, regardless of race, gender, ethnicity, um, regardless of whether they have an attorney or not. Um, but I think being patient and giving everybody the same respect um, can really help to put people at ease. And obviously, you know, being transparent as possible with what's going on, um, with what resources are available, um, things of that nature. But oftentimes I think justice court is, is a court that impacts many people for many different reasons, whether you're a victim of a crime, applying for a temporary protective order, things of that nature. And so ultimately I would say respect comes first and foremost. Commander Haynes. And I'd also like to ask everybody to please shut their cell phone sound off so we don't hear any random beeps. It also might be interfering with our microphone system. So Commander Haynes, next question. Andre. Andre Haynes, Armed Forces Chamber. This question is for both of you. Do you believe the requirement for individuals to pay the balance due or post a bond within 90 calendar days in order to challenge a civil infraction citation is always affordable or fair considering potential financial constraints that some defendants may face? So Madeline, you'll start this round of questions. So I think that's a great question. I think obviously financial hardships is something that in justice court, obviously we're dealing with individuals that combat that um, quite frequently. Um, you're mentioning civil, obviously in criminal cases, there could be fines, restitution, things of that nature. Um, I've never believed that anybody should be subject to jail time because they can't pay or afford to pay. Um, I think that there's other options that can be imposed. And I think as long as somebody is making good faith efforts, whether that's through, you know, showing up to court, explaining the nature of why they can't pay or what they're doing to pay, um, if applicable in certain situations, having that converted to community service, if monetary um, issues are a problem. But I don't think anybody should ever be punished for an ability not being able to pay a balance on something. Certainly never should be thrown in, in jail because they can't pay for something. So since you're talking about civil infractions, that's a very different thing than criminal. Civil infractions and underneath AB 116 do have a requirement that um, you do need to post a bond if you do want to contest it. However, um, if there is somebody that has financial difficulties in doing that, there is a process in place that they can fill out um, an affidavit um, asking that um, they can proceed in form of papyrus and not have to post that bond. So there is a specific avenue to have that happen. Um, and, and that assures that people that are of um, an inability financially to handle things that they still can challenge their civil infraction citations, still have their day in court and still be able to proceed. If they were found responsible, there are other avenues for them to be able to handle that fine payment, including a conversion underneath statute to community service. Patsy Brown, Armed Forces Chamber. The question is for both of you. Can you share your experiences or initiatives from your past that demonstrate your commitment to supporting veterans and their unique challenges within the legal framework? 
So I have been participating um, and being a presiding judge over specialty courts for quite some time. So I am very knowledgeable about um, our veterans that are coming in involved in the criminal justice system and how they can be diverted or deflected into um, a treatment court to try to help with their unique needs and to connect them back in to services so that they can hopefully escape the criminal justice system completely. Talking about evictions, because we do have veterans, unfortunately, that do come before the court on non-payment of rent. I am involved um, with um, a group of stakeholders that we are looking on ways to connect our most vulnerable with um, financial assistance, temporary financial assistance to get them um, where they can stay in their unit or have the ability to gracefully transition out without an eviction on the record. So being a chief deputy district attorney, I have often had cases wherein the offender was perhaps a veteran um, or had served at some point in the military. And I think um, as a veteran, those that have essentially risked their lives for the freedoms that we, ha that we have today have oftentimes had experiences, whether it's you know PTSD, mental health issues, and oftentimes um, can face difficulties and issues that maybe somebody who's not a veteran pose. Um, certainly Justice Court has the Veterans Court Program, um, which is ran by Judge Letizia. I have actually participated in negotiations where we have contemplated that um, as a resource to potentially um, help veterans. That's a court that's specifically designed for people that have served in our military um, and that can provide them with the resources um, and programs that can potentially help them navigate with particular issues that veterans deal with. Kelly Charles, uh, Democratic Veterans Caucus. Um, just to get to know you both a little bit better, uh, share with us how you have engaged with the veteran and the military community. Madeline. So I have a family that have served in the military. My uncle on my father's side served in the Navy for many years. Um, my grandmother's um, brother, so I guess my uncle was a prisoner of war. Um, and so from a very young age, um, whether it was participating in Memorial Day activities, um, decorating the graves of those that had passed um, in cemeteries, that is something that has meant a lot and that patriotism has been instilled in me from a very young age understanding and supporting um, those that have served and the sacrifice um, that comes along with that. Um, obviously, I've, I've been touched because I actually have family that has served in the military, and so I've kind of seen the firsthand sacrifice and things of that nature that go along with that. But I would definitely say um, bringing awareness to veterans and Memorial Days, participating in those types of activities is something that I personally have been a part of. So my father served um, in the Navy. My husband um, is a Air Force veteran. My JEA is an Air Force veteran. So I, I'm, I'm fairly dialed in with veterans. I myself um, did not serve, uh, but I do have very close connections with um, former military members. I think in talking to them with some of the challenges that they experienced in coming back into society and um, how that intersects into our justice system is always on the forefront of being knowledgeable, um, seeing what's out there. While I don't do the Veterans Treatment Court, I have had veterans intersect with me with both my repeat offender DUI court and with my drug court. And we've worked with them on how we can find them more robust services in addition to getting back connected with the VA so that they can um, overcome a lot of the barriers that they may have had through homelessness and everything else. Rob. Rob Lauer, Veterans and Politics. So this, this is uh, for both of you, however, is specifically to Judge uh, Cruz related to a case that you oversaw in July 2019 where a defendant um, was charged with resisting an officer um, with deadly force, with, I'm sorry, with a deadly weapon, and uh, charged with a false statement to obstruct an officer. And uh, according to the court docket, 
uh, you released that defendant OR. Can you explain what possibly your thinking would be to release uh, a defendant OR who resisted an officer with a weapon? So a lot of times um, I'd have to refresh my recollection with the court docket so that I could appropriately give you. But frequently what happens, um, we have some case law that controls on um, release conditions. Um, and it is also incumbent on the prosecutor to make a particular argument by clear and convincing standards as to why somebody should either A, remain in jail, B, have bail, or three, have other release conditions. Without being able to refresh my recollection and looking at that, usually on something similar to that, it probably sounds like the argument may have been um, either no opposition to being released um, or potentially uh, the state may have asked for additional time or potentially the state didn't meet their burden of arguing by clear and convincing evidence that the person needed to remain being incarcerated. So just to be fair, Madeline, I know that the question was directed to Judge Cruz, but if you could answer the question, uh, if that was a similar type case that was going to be in front of you or if you've dealt with those issues before, just to keep things fair, okay? So there are certain um, case law and statutes that determine um, when bail is appropriate, when it's not. The seminal case, uh, Valdez Jimenez, essentially stated that the presumption is an OR, an own recognizance release, um, but that it's on the state of Nevada, so in my capacity on a, as a prosecutor, to determine by clear and convincing evidence that there are no non-monetary conditions that can be placed on the defendant to ensure the safety of the community and the return to court. Um, so certainly, there's a litany of factors that are illustrated in the NRS that go along with that case law that talk about ties to the community, the facts of the case, a criminal record. I would say certainly in that case, just by the charges, I think that it would be appropriate um, and that burden certainly could have been met wherein the court could have granted um, monetary bail. That courtroom and that's, or excuse me, that standard is met every single day in courtrooms. Um, the state proves by clear and convincing evidence that bail is necessary. Um, obviously, I don't know the facts of that case, but that standard is met in courtrooms every single day. Thank you. Frank? Frank Friends, Veterans of Politics. So a lot of talk lately about DEI, which needs to just DIE, honestly. Um, they're worried about the background or race of somebody that comes in front of you during a case when people statistically don't understand that it's going against somebody of their own race anyway. That's who the crime was committed against. So are you going to take background and racial things into play? Are you just going to take the facts of the case and the history of the defendant in front of you in the case? So before we answer that question, I just want to let our audience know and our viewers, um, sometimes uh, when you're you know, in the court system or you're on a panel, we throw out little acronyms and maybe everybody doesn't know what that means. So um, DEI would be diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'm sure you guys know what that means, but I wanted to let our audience members and those listening remotely what um, those three initials stood for. So I think, Madeline, are you up next? Yes. So as a judge, you are a fair and impartial and neutral arbiter. You are to look at the facts of the case and apply the facts to the law. Um, certainly things like race, um, gender, should not and would not play um, any part in my decision making. As a judge, you look at the totality of the circumstances, the facts as they are, um, and make decisions applied to law. Um, certainly, I think it's inappropriate, illegal, unethical, um, all of the above to ever um, make a specific decision based on someone's race or their gender or their sexual orientation. Um, and certainly, I would never um, do that as a judge, and I've never done that as a district attorney. And, and I'm echoing, as what Madeline said. Um, being a judge is meant to be an impartial and fair forum. Um, we are obligated as judges at the Las Vegas Justice Carpet to follow the law, um, not to legislate from the bench. That means 
that you take into consideration the facts and the law that is in front of you. You are not to be bringing in race, gender, or any other factors um, in making those determinations. So uh, that would not be something that would come into um, my weighing or balancing of the facts or the law that's before me. Tara. Hello, my name is Tara Kellogg and, and I'm here with the Democratic Party. Um, my, questions, uh, my question is, can you provide an example of a legal principle or precedent that you believe is essential for ensuring fair and just outcomes in types of, of cases typically heard in the justice courts? Well, I think I think all of our all of our laws and our constitution um, are grounded in a fair and neutral forum. So the very principles um, that, as a judge, we're supposed to stand for is to be a fair, impartial, and neutral forum. It's not for me as a judge to weigh my personal or impart my personal viewpoints in, that's not my role. My role is to follow our laws, follow our constitution, apply it equitably, fairly, and impartially based upon each individualized case that comes before me. Yes, yeah, so I would reiterate, as a judge, we don't enact the law, we don't create the law. Um, the legislator creates the law, the Nevada Supreme Court interprets that law, and as a justice of the peace, I have to follow that law. Whether I agree with it or not, um, I cannot use any of my political, personal beliefs, influence that. Um, I have to apply facts to the law and the precedent that exists. Um, certainly I think this can be, you know, when we're learning about the branches of government being the executive, the legislative, the judiciary, at least when I was in, ho in high school and during my education background, we talk a lot about the executive and the legislative branch. The judiciary is a little, you know, small. Um, and I believe it's our job as, you know, putting ourselves in these positions to inform the electorate um, that that's what our job is to do. That We don't really take our political beliefs, our personal beliefs, that we follow the law that's enacted by the legislature, um, whether we agree with it or not, and what the Supreme Court says about those statutes. Okay, our final question, Barbara. Hi, Barbara with uh, Veterans in Politics. Um, there's always a time in our lives where we have to make that one decision that's gonna impact our lives and our careers. Describe that day or that moment where you actually decided, you know what, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna run. What was that? Kind of take us to that fun moment there. So that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I knew I always wanted to be in public service from a young age. And so I've, I've had my entire career um, in the Clark County District Attorney's Office. And I certainly thought at some point I would take it to that next level and run for office. Um, it presented itself a lot sooner than me. And I can't really explain it other than just a universal push that this was the time to do something. And obviously putting yourself out there, um, running for any elected position um, is scary, it's intimidating. But at this point in my career, I honestly felt it's the, it's the best place for me to go to make the biggest impact on the community. Um, as a prosecutor and representing the state of Nevada, when I get up in trial, I tell the jury, I represent the state of Nevada. Um, and at this point in my career, it felt like the most natural progression. So I'm very excited about that. So back in 2012 is when I, I made the leap to run for office um, and run for this seat. At that point, I had both experience in criminal law, civil law, juvenile law, and some family law. And when I made the call to run for this, well, first to run, um, then I felt that my breadth of experience um, was best suited 
for the Las Vegas Justice Court. I felt that was the best spot that I could transition um, into um, public service at that point. I come from a family that, that has been rooted in public service, and I felt this was the next step for me to transition into. Um, I made that call, I ran, I was successful, and I've been your judge in that department since. Okay, so we're gonna wrap it up now. So Judge Cruz, we'll start with you. Closing statement briefly, why are you the best person to be in Las Vegas um, Justice Court Department 5? Well, I've been, like I said at the start, um, since being elected to the bench, I've worked on um, a variety of things to help improve not only the justice system, but how the justice system connects with our community. Um, I currently serve on the um, Clark County Criminal Justice Coordinating Council, say that fast for a whole bunch of times, and that works with many stakeholders in the community and the criminal justice community to work on identifying problems within our community and how, as a criminal justice system from all avenues, we can work on improving some of the problems that we see consistently in our community. I sit on the Access to Justice Commission through the Nevada Supreme Court, um, working on trying to find better ways for people in the community that are less in, unable to hire an attorney, how they can access the justice system better. Um, I've sat on the specialty court uh, policy and funding committee so that we develop policies to help people in finding treatment court programs to help out. And I hope you keep me in this position. Thank you. Madeline. So obviously, as I explained, um, I'm from Las Vegas. I have a long family history in Nevada. And I think that's really important because I really do care about this community. It's been my home. I'm a fourth generation Nevadan for generations, and I'm currently raising my own family here. And so I want Las Vegas um, to be the best city possible. Um, you know, my entire career thus far has been in public service, and I think that's the best place to be. Um, we certainly don't do it for the money, but we do it because we wanna make a change and we wanna make an impact. And at this point in my career, I really think the best way I can do that um, is serving the people in Justice Court. And Justice Court really is a court for the people. Um, like we said, many people come in there without attorneys, and I currently work for the people, and I can promise you if elected, I will always remember that I work to the people and I answer to the people. But specifically, having the endorsement of an organization like this um, means so much to me and would be such an honor because I know how important veterans are and what they believe and who they support, and it would be an absolute honor to be endorsed by your organization. Well, again, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out this afternoon. You guys given up your Saturday, our panel members for being here, um, Veterans and in Politics International, the Nevada Democratic Veterans and Military Family Caucus, Nevada Veterans Association, and the Armed Forces Chamber PAC. Uh, Monzu Italian Oven and Bar for sponsoring this event today and giving us this nice forum. The food was fantastic. They fed us lunch, so come back and eat if you haven't done that already. Um, Stephanie Phillips, candidate for United States Senate, and an anonymous donation on behalf of Jerry Willock. Thank you again very much for being here with us today. Thank you.